Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, uh, I want to invite you to be part of this um, time that we're together in the forum. From what I understand, y'all have a lot of great discussion here. Um, that it's, you have these microphones, I think, on your tables that you can share uh, if you have questions. And I invite you to just break in and just say, hey, what about this? Or I have a question. Or what's the group think about this? And uh, we can discuss it openly and freely as best we can. Um, we are at, taking a look at this book. Does everybody have this book and have been looking at it and reading it, Simply Christian? That's where we are, right? That's what we're doing in this class. <laughs> yeah. And I think we're on chapter 13 is what I heard. Uh, the book, God Breathed. I had the opportunity to read this book a while back, when, uh, and I, I think it's an excellent book to... to um, uh, Molly, did y'all do this class in the parenting class already? And transitioned in here. Okay, yes, in the parenting class. Yes, so um, N.T. Wright, as many of you know, um, is a good friend of Dr. DePaz, of Daniel's, and uh, Daniel uh, served with him at Oxford. And uh, he's about, I would say, the leading uh, authority in Christian world right now uh, that people respect uh, is one of the top writers and leaders in Christian thought in the world. He's over in England, and uh, we have quite a few of his books, don't we, Mary Jane, in the library? Several. Yeah, several copies. And if you ever want to read more, check out our library. Um, N.T. Wright uh, refers to the Holy Bible as the book God breathed. And as you can see, I have some handouts here. We won't get through everything. There's a lot of handouts today. There's like six pages or eight pages of handouts that I have like front and back. So it's four pages front and back. But we will, we will focus on this one that says the book God breathed, the Holy Bible. We'll focus on that one this morning to try to get through that. That has some questions in it. And then the rest is, uh, I wanted to point out that this one I did, it was called Fun Facts to Paw Seminary Note Noteworthy Notes. And the reason I put this together is because when I took his New Testament and Old Testament classes, these are some of the fun facts that he gave us on a test that we, we had to memorize and be ready to answer for a test in our head uh, when we sat down to write. Because Dr. Tapa, like the people in England where N.T. Wright lives, when you take a test, it's writing. It's just writing everything you know from the time you've heard the lectures and all your reading, and then you are to put it together like a paper with footnotes, with what you're referencing, and do it academically. So uh, these are just some of the fun notes he wanted us to memorize um, in here. So, and some of the things I've put in there uh, that if I was writing a test for Dr. DePa, I would try to do this. And then he always had define. He would have definitions at the end that you would have to write little, little short, little, like he would put on their testament. And I know we read about that in this chapter, about what testament means. And it says, in translation, this means covenant, fulfilling of the old to the new, the 39 books to the 27 books. And the more facts you put like that, the more credit you get for Dr. DePa. Like he gets, get, he goes plus one or whatever, you know. So, so there you go. So this was just sort of a little fun little thing I wanted y'all to take home and look at. If you decide you want to take one of his classes, you can have this as your cheat sheet. But you, you don't want to cheat. You just want to tell him you're ready for the class. Okay. So take that and and with you if you sign up for his classes. Um, so I, I'd like to take a look at what you thought um, when N.T. Wright posed to us, when you pick up your Bible, you need to remind yourself that you hold in your hands not only the most famous book in the world, but one with extraordinary power to change lives and to change communities, to change the world. He goes on to say, but surely someone will say, only God gets to change the world like that. How can we say that a mere book can do such a thing? It's a vital element in Christian faith and life. As a Christian, you cannot do without it, he says. 
And for us today, our discussion is going to be about the Bible and how it is inspirational and inspires us. And we're going to read uh, one scripture in three different versions in just a minute. But I'm going to ask you that question to open up. How do you think, as a Christian, what is the Bible to you? This was a question that was asked of me in one of my first classes, in my hermeneutics class that I took up at Wesley Seminary. The professor went around the room and she said to each person, now before you finish your journey, you have to know how you feel about this book. Now I want you to tell me, how do you feel about this book? What is it to you? And, you know, you should have seen the expressions on the face of about 20 people in that class. Some people were really shocked. Like, and then some were like, oh, I'm so relaxed. I'm, I know what this book is. So it's good, I think, especially for seminary students to know what this book is <laughs> and what it means. So what does it mean to you? Any, any comments on this? What does the Bible mean to you? Grab a mic. Thank you. Mary Jane? For me, it's the book of life. Mm, good. Love that. And we can, you can do it in one sentence or a phrase, uh, or you can say something that it is for you. Yes? Holy Spirit moves around us when we Oh, I love it. The gift of the Holy Spirit moves with us. Yes, yeah, beautiful. There we go. Every day, right? Yes. Strength and hope. Any other words or feelings about it? I know what I said when she asked me. I said, it's my friend. It's my friend each day, um, and it's been my guidebook. Um, And I, I think during that time, it was right when my father had passed away. And, you know, I found it as um, a time of grief for me, which uh, our group here at Parkwood that we've been going through during, it was a, it has lament in it. It has uh, everything. And we're going to talk about that, what the Bible's made up of. But it's inspiration, it's mystery, it's power, it's a guidebook for life. Uh, The Bible is alive, you know, when you look at those facts that I have there on the deposit sheet, uh, it says that it's been translated into over 3,000 languages and that it is uh, the most important book and most published book of all time. It's influenced history. It's in, in, it continues to influence history. It's changed history. It's holy when we say that, and look at that, holy, it is the rock. The children this week, uh, Breaker Rock Beach is, was the theme, and the rock, I asked them the question, what is the Bible the rock? Is Jesus the rock? And they, the children screaming, you know, like I said the whole time, saying, yes, yes, Jesus, Bible, you know, because the, the Bible is a rock that we can always go to and we can always hold on to. So, yes, the Bible is is our inspiration and it is um, the center of who we are as Christians uh, along with Jesus. And and interestingly, uh, in this scripture that he talks about in this chapter, 2 Timothy 3, 16-17, can I have three volunteers to read that in three different translations. The first one is in the NIV. It's there on your, it's there on your sheet if you want to take a look at it. You just grab a mic and, uh, and we can read together. Molly, you want to do the first one, the NIV? Thank you. Uh-huh. You got it? Thank you. There at 16. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thank you. Who would like to read from the Living Bible? It's right there on the, on the page, if you'd like to just look at the page. 
the whole Bible was given to us by inspiration from God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and helps us to do what is right. It is God's way of making us well prepared at every point, fully equipped to do good to everyone. And that's the Living Bible. Mm -hmm. I remember the Living Bible from my grandmother. She used to have a Living Bible, and uh, I just put that in there thinking of her today. <laughs> um, the Amplified Bible, the next one, would someone mind reading that? We can have the same readers again, if, if anybody wants to read again. You got it, Mary Jane? Okay, Th thank you so much. It's the one that says all scripture. All scripture is God breathing, God breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin, for correction of error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thank you. Uh, sometimes I like to put the Amplified in there because they have lots of adjectives and, and things to explain. So thank you, Mary Jane. Um, so, you know, hearing three different versions of that scripture, and I know you've heard this scripture before in 2 Timothy in this letter from Paul um, about the Bible, what comparisons do you see? in there about the Bible is God-breathed. Um, that What does that mean? And you can see there from the Amplified Bible that it says, given by divine inspiration. That's God-breathed, that ins inspired by God. Um, and what are some other similarities from those three verses that you see um, in, in trying to pull out what this scripture means? Well, I think the Holy Spirit revealed to the authors the things that they brought to remembrance or explained mm -hmm. to reveal what they wanted to bring mm -hmm. forward as part of God's Word. That's good, Roger. Thank you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is, is alive and well. And, and, and what I believe that um, in looking at, you know, these different versions, and that's another thing about, um, well, in these little fun facts, there are so many different versions now of the Bible. You can see um, that the progression and how it, through history and as N.T. Wright talked about in this chapter, uh, that the Bible has, you know, it hasn't changed really in these versions. It's, it's tried to say true to itself, but think about how many languages, too, that we've uh, gone through to get to the canons of the Bible, uh, to being translated. Um, we, we have the Hebrew Bible uh, that was first given to us through the Old Testament, and then from the Hebrew, we went to the, the next version of the Bible was um, the Greek version, the Greeks, because the new Christians needed it translated in a language that they could keep going on and when they were meeting two, two to three centuries later and uh, after Jesus had come. And that's when it was uh, said that from there, the Greek to the Latin, because the Romans, and from the Latin then to the English. And you can see how uh, the, it, the translations then started in English because of the printing press and because of the way that we needed to educate more people to be able to read because people didn't know how to read in English and throughout Europe. And then as it spread, you can see from 1382 to 2001 that that's the Wycliffe Bible going all the way to the English Standard Version. And so then from there, even more versions of the Bible, translated in English. But I put a little picture on the back of the DePauw uh, notes 
Well, no, it's on the back of your notes. Sorry about that. The notes from today. That picture of the Gutenberg Bible. Has anyone ever seen a copy of the Gutenberg Bible? That's the German Bible that was first printed. Have anybody seen a copy of it ever in a museum? Have you seen it, Roger, in a museum? Because there's several of the original ones. I'm not sure how many of the original ones that are, you know, in the paper that is still, and they have it. There is. I was just about to get to that. There's one in the Bible Museum. I think there's also one down at, uh, in Orlando at the, I think so too, that you're right that. I forget what they call it. Here, here in the United States, I think there's several copies. You can look it up on the internet. But I th think that w people had bought them over time and they were very valuable and you know, kept them. Um, I think but it was called the Holy Land experience. Holy Land, but they okay. They had a lot of copies of, of Bibles. Version. If you really, and I wanted to bring that up, if you want to see a Gutenberg Bible, you can see one here at the Bible Museum up in D.C. And I, I highly recommend going to the Bible Museum to take family members going to see. It's, uh, it's an experience in itself. There's some amazing things there. Uh, to, and, and they have a printing press. They have the Gutenberg Bible out. And then they have a printing press that looks like the first printing press that was used. And they have someone who's there as a student. And they talk to you about it and about how the Bible was first produced. And uh, it's just that some of the uh, exhibits there are so well done. Smithsonian quality. Um, I was able to do a back room tour uh, not too long ago with uh, some of the people from the Washington Theological Consortium, and they took us back where they're preparing the Bible. This is how precious the Bible is to some, certain people and leaders of our country. Jimmy Carter gave one of his Bibles already to have on display when he passes from this world they're going to have it there at the Bible Museum. They're going to take it and put it out on the street for people to go by and look at. And his notes and his writing of how he has, the Bible has been such an important part of his life, he wants it on display for people. More than he wants his body on display, he wanted his Bible on display to say, this has been my guidebook. So they have it, preparing it, and they're putting it together, and you could take a look at it, you know, if you were back there with the curators, and to see, and you could see he'd written notes all in his Bible. He had several copies of Bibles there, but uh, that he wanted to contribute to the museum and give it to them versus anyone else. There's also a Bible from uh, Neil Armstrong that he took into space there, and uh, it, it's, you know, they, they, I heard from the curator that they, they took a plane down to get it in Houston, Texas, when he decided to donate it, his family did, and uh, so that they could put it into the Bible Museum. There's some, some really interesting exhibits there of Bibles that people have had over the years, famous people and people, just anyone, about how special it is. So I just wanted to throw that in there that if you, if you want to take a tour there, it's a, it's a great, um, great place to see the history of the Bible and uh, just what the Bible means to so many. One thing that was yeah. interesting was when they started to make copies available, how uh, the early translators were persecuted mm. for Mm. writing the Bible, and there's a number of them, that some put to death mm -hmm. because they translated the Bible so people could read. The translators, think about that too in other countries. We know that from mission stories that taking a Bible into somewhere that you can be persecuted for it. Uh, to, it is, people risk their lives to carry Bibles into places. Uh, we, we've heard that many times, and uh, there's accounts of that and stories of that. Uh, I remember before the wall came down um, that, that I went with a group of people, and they asked me to put some Bibles in my luggage to go across to East Germany. And I was like, well, what happens if somebody finds it? And they said, well, are you willing to, to risk that? And uh, I said, well... I, I'll put it in my luggage and pray <laughs> over it, and that you can have my luggage and take it, and I'll see how we do. And and those Bibles got over there, 
and uh, we did it. I was just a young army wife, not uh, care pretty carefree, and uh, I had a baby though. I should have been thinking, but uh, but I was willing. The Bibles got over there, uh, but yes, yeah, sir. What story about Brother Andrew? I think it was that had copies of the Bible, and he just put them in the front seat of the car, and he prayed that uh, not yeah. that the blind would see, but the seeing would be blind, oh. and he'd drive right ah. through the checkpoint with all these Bibles. Bibles that weren't supposed to come into the country. And the seeing were blind then, and they made it through. We know many stories about people risking everything to carry the word. Um, Again, I think that's inspiration, too. That's the Holy Spirit coming into play, the power of the Holy Spirit. All right, well, taking, taking a look at, those, um, th- at this verse is sort of our foundation today of what we're studying in this chapter about uh, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righte- and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, that, I think, is what the thesis of the book is. Simply Christian, this is an important chapter because the Holy Bible is very important in our Christian walk and our spiritual formation. Knowing and getting closer to everything we can through the Bible, through the Word of God, is what helps us develop as an individual and also be able to share the gospel. Uh, The word theonoustos, which is Greek, is, means God breathed. The breath of God, uh, that part of God's being, is what N.T. Wright was talking about, is this powerful living word that makes the Bible this living word a little different from a, a regular book. You know, I also shared this complete God to the Bible, which I think is probably one of the best, and that's what these pages are from. These pages that I ran off for you, these color pages, I had a bunch of these from another class that I was doing, and these are really helpful just to give you a little bit of a bridge between the New Testament and the Old Testament and what, how that Bible is formed. But this book has helped so many people in my family understand the Bible better, and it's great for youth, it's great for children uh, that are a little older that can read this, and it's great for people studying, trying to teach Sunday school classes, that kind of thing. What I love about it, it has some beautiful art illustrations, too, that through the ages, and um, you can see this, this picture of Paul that's on your, your handout here, uh, and there's also a, a beautiful painting that's below here of the council that that um, ruled to say what what Bible uh, what canon uh, would be okayed for becoming the Bible. This is a picture of that council. It's a painted picture, but it's a Russian picture. Um, but the the artwork in this is just gorgeous. This is this painting is a. Um, through a museum in New York of Paul and Paul with the Bible. And Paul, as you know, is probably, besides God and Moses, everybody attributes most of the Bible, the New Testament, to Paul, a lot of it. So um, we, I put the picture there. So if you're interested in this book, The Complete Guide to the Bible, I think I mentioned it on your handout, by Miller, by Stephen Miller. Highly recommend it for helping others learn more about the Bible. Um, It's a supplement to our own Bible. And the Bible is God-breathed. It's life-giving to us as believers. Um, And Wright's summation of the Bible, it makes it very rich. And he talks about a a wrap-up of the origin of the Bible in those pages there that he said, uh, I think it was like pages, when you get into like toward 180, um, before that in the 170s, uh, he is talking about the story of the Bible's composition, the collection, and the distribution. And he uh, says, but seeking it out in this way seems to be like trying to describe my best friend by offering a biochemical analysis of his genetic makeup. Uh, This is important 
indeed, if he didn't have this genetic makeup, he would be the same person. But what is missing? What is the je ne sais quoi? Where is, what is, the, what he's saying by that, I think, is where the breath, where the inspiration comes from, and what is the difference of this, this whole idea when he discusses this in the book, inspired and inspiration. One, inspired is the verb, inspire, to inspire, and inspiration is the noun. So let's think about that for just a moment. What, talk about the inspired and inspiration definition of what the Bible is to us. What might we glean from N.T. Wright's thoughts, if you read this chapter, about how this work for Christians regarding the Bible being breathed into us, the Bible is being breathed into us so that we can breathe it out to others. What is, what does that mean to you? I, I guess that's what I mean as inspiration. I mean, we talked a little bit about it when Carol said Holy Spirit. Do you feel differently when you read the Bible sometimes? Does it give you answers by reading it? And what's the difference in, say, Molly reading it and me reading it? And, you know, this is part, as Baptists, what we believe we're able to do, right? Have that ability to read the Bible and interpret and listen for the Holy Spirit, right? So what do you think, you know, inspiration means to you? when you read the Bible. Have you ever had a moment where you could really tell when you're reading the Bible that God is speaking to you? I know I have. Anybody? Yes, sir. For me, the, uh, the Bible is a, um, a relatable instrument. Uh, the stories that you have in there are things that uh, we can live by and we see in the community Mm. And we see that people have not changed, mm. even in 2,000 years. The, the stories that we see there are as applicable today as they were then. Uh, so it's, it's something that, uh, like you say, it's living and it's ongoing. And breathing. Yeah, that's excellent. And, you know, he's so right, and that's what we were going for, too, is that Every story in there, and I remember sitting in class one time and one night, and Dr. Pa said, uh, the Bible is, is life. It's life now. It's just not life yesterday. It, when you take characters like David and uh, Rahab, and let's just take any character in the Bible, they're going to be somebody we know, right? They're going to be a story. There's a story in there for everybody and everything. And I, I think that's what's so gorgeous about the Bible is that it was given to us through the ages. Think about it for your grandparents, for people 200 years ago. It was, it was for them. Now think about your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and people in the future. It's for them and how they're going to relate to it. That makes it a living, breathing, Holy Spirit-given book. If it can do that back here and be about people and all our stuff that we do, our sinfulness, our craziness, the, you know, the things that we are given, think about you know, the gifts that we're given. That's all there in the Bible. You know, there were architects, there were uh, artists, there were singers, there were uh, all kinds of people doing trades, tent makers, doing everything in the Bible. It's very exciting when you think about, uh, it talks about life, like you said. It talks about life. And it's life breathed. So that, I think, is the, 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 the verb inspired and the noun, inspiration, both. It's living and working with us all the time, and we're living and working with it through the ages. I don't know any other book that can do that, do you? <laughs> it's special. The Holy Bible is holy. And... Uh, as, as we wrap up, I'm going to wrap up a little bit early today. I hope y'all don't mind um, because I have to do a few things in worship today. But um, 
when we, we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together and this completion, uh, you know, Dr. DePaul used, used to use an illustration in our class of the cross, and he would say the old and the new on each side of the cross, and he would say that bridge in between was Jesus, okay? And the Old Testament, or the, the old stories that we, that predicted that Jesus was coming, and the new is what the new believers were doing and Jesus living, and Jesus doing his mission, and then also the revelation of how we go into the future with it. So it's this whole completion. The Bible is this, and it goes this way, but also it's this way from God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's the cross. You know, he's probably done that illustration some way for y'all before, hasn't he? He does that in our class a lot, but um, it's this, the cross, the old and the new, the bridge of Jesus. So think of it that way, and that the Bible is in the intersection of all of that at the cross to give us that completion as believers. So you think about it in this way, too. You can think about Old Testament, the works of the Father leading us up to completion, the New Testament concluding the works of the Son and the Holy Spirit, because in that part of the Bible, the New Testament talks about the Son really coming. He's, he's predicted and coming in the Old Testament. He's here in the New Testament. He's living. He's showing us. He's resurrected. And then that power of the resurrection and also the Holy Spirit coming down on him. So you've got the Father. You've got the Son on the cross and the Holy Spirit over here. So again, completion, and that it's God-breathed, and uh, you remembering this scripture. If someone says to you, uh, oh, well, let me tell you about the Bible um, a little bit, and you want to sit down with them, and you can read that, that scripture to them and talk to them a little bit about who God is, that's a evangelistic sort of scripture in its own way, um, and sharing the, the word with somebody. Um, those last two paragraphs uh, in the chapter, I'm just going to, does anybody have a book besides, I don't see books out here. Well, Carol's got one. Um, okay, and, and if, if you would, somebody, I can read it. If you want to look at it, we can do it together. I'll read those last two paragraphs because I thought that was beautiful and a beautiful way to end this today. Um, and we can have comments before we go. He talks about these options. Uh, too, about looking and thinking about the Bible and that it is God-breathed and inspired. But I'll read this last two. I think this is very important for us today about how we're looking at everything in our country, too, about being united uh, together and to opening our minds up that the Bible is there to enable God's people to be equipped I'm sorry, I'm on page 183 and 184 at the very bottom, the last two paragraphs. I'm going to read just this one quote real quick, and then I'll read those two paragraphs. The Bible is there, that's on 184, and then we'll go back. The Bible is there to enable God's people to be equipped to do God's work in God's world. That's our church right? Not to give them an excuse to sit back smugly knowing they possess all God's truth. That's what Wright says. So it's, this is our mission with the Bible, that is to enable God's people to be equipped to do God's work in the world. I look at the Facets Project, Larry. That's one way. Giving a uh, backpack. People think, oh, I'm just buying pencils. No, you're, you're buying more than pencils when you're giving to that. You're giving children who don't have pencils a way to write, and you're helping the world in that way. And where others can't do for themselves, we can help them do. That's what the church is here for, uh, especially the least of these. So thanks for doing the Facets Project, and thanks for uh, getting school supplies for children. That's one way the church can help in that way. So I'll read these last two paragraphs. Such debates, in my view, says Wright, distract attention from the real point of what the Bible is there for. I'm reminded of a legend about Karl Barth, and he was a theologian, 
um, on being asked by a woman whether the serpent in Genesis actually spoke. He replied, Madam, it doesn't matter whether the serpent spoke. What matters is what the serpent said. Squabbling over particular definitions of the qualities of the Bible is like a married couple squabbling over which of them loves the child, their children more when they should be getting on with bringing them up and setting them with a good example. The Bible is there to enable God's people to be equipped to do God's work in God's world, not to give them an excuse to sit back smugly knowing they possess all God's truth. Well said, N.T. Wright. And uh, with that, we'll start concluding. And if you have any comments before we go, I'd love to hear. Anything else that you'd like to say about the Bible today and about it being inspired by God and what it means? Well, I'd just say that I think Luke doesn't get enough credit in the New Testament because, one, he support completely supported himself and other missionaries mm. uh, and then also because of the he was the gospel of Luke and the acts of the Holy Spirit are probably a couple very important sections yes thank you for saying that Roger Luke um, is attributed to writing the, the acts too as we know in those two whole sections of the Bible. And I agree with you. That's an important part of the Bible. A lot of times I remember growing up in the Baptist church and, and we would read the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and especially John we were really focused on. And I remember the Acts never got a lot of you know, news. Um, and so the Acts to me are like the modern... They were the first Christians, and all this that, that was going on with them, I, I think paying attention to that and knowing a little bit more about that is, uh, is excellent. One other thing I'd like to point out, you know, our library uh, has lots of great books and has a lot of great uh, reference material, and you can talk to more our library committee if you'd like to know more about guidance there in the library. Um, this book, Dead Sea Scrolls, also talks about some of the history and the discovery of it. Um, I've got a copy of that. I just happened to get that from my sister-in-law when we were going through the boxes. And of all things, I mean, I was like, I, have, I didn't have a copy of it. She had a copy of it, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it really talks about it. So I think she was, uh, she's been talking to me like, here's some material, Trenda, for your class. You're going to be teaching. I didn't know I was going to be in here today. But uh, it's funny how things come together, isn't it? And then N.T. Wright, I've had this, Mary Jane, I wanted to give it to the library. I don't know if y'all have it or not, but it's N.T. Wright going on a trip in the Holy Land, and he talks about the New Testament. So this might, you don't have that? This might be a good uh, reference material for a class sometimes. So I'd like to donate this to the library. Um, so, and I, I, I haven't even opened it yet, so... I don't know what it's like, so I might want to review it, but it's, I would bet it's good if he did it. Um, so we have lots of good reference. Do you want to say anything regarding reference material that, or anything? The complete guide? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll be donating another copy. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah, that's okay. I, I'd put you on the spot. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, well, we do have you, I know you do. You, our library is excellent down there, Mary Jane. Thank you. Yeah, the library is a great resource. Thank you. Yes, sir. One of the other uh, historical books, I think, is Josephus. Mm. It includes a lot of information on. All right. Anything else you'd like to share today before we go? Any questions? Um, I hope you're enjoying this book. It's, it's a good one. Anything else before we go? 
All right, well, I'll say a prayer uh, to dismiss us. And uh, again, sorry, I have, I'm letting us out a little early. What time do we normally get out? 1030? Okay. All right. Good, good. All right. We go now, Lord, uh, in the presence of our brothers and sisters here and those that will worship today for our United Sunday that we will be with our brothers and sisters from the Spanish Fellowship. Lord, be with us as we have our quarterly business meeting today and be with those that are not with us. Touch them and heal them and let them know that we're thinking of them. And Father, we thank you for another wonderful day in your church. Let us be your light. Let your word guide us and be the inspiration for our lives. As we study the word, please reveal it to us. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us here at Parkwood. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for having me.